Yeah, all right, everybody. Zach here with RevZilla, and welcome to another episode of Daily Rider. Our guest today is the Zero DSRX. That is a full-blown, bona fide electric motorcycle with 100 horsepower on tap and an MSRP of $25,000. So, as with any electric motorcycle, there are some little questions swirling around. Like, is it fun to ride? Is it even good as a piece of equipment? We'll talk about all that, I promise. But with this bike, there's a bigger question, I think, which is that, the brochure will tell you it's an adventure motorcycle, but electric bikes have never been famously good with range, right? So is this machine that has appropriate wheel sizes and appropriate suspension travel and appropriate comfort, can it be considered an ADV, even though you got to plug it into a wall somewhere? It's a bit of a chin scratcher, huh? Well, let's get to riding so we can talk about it. All right. Alrighty, Zero DSRX, ready to go. A uh, friendly reminder that this episode of Daily Rider is brought to you by our friends at Rever. Rever is a mobile app that allows you to plan and track any ride and then share that ride information and photos with your friends and an online riding community. You can download it for free at your app store of choice or to learn more, go to rever.co. Alrighty, Zero DSRX Daily Ride. Uh, electric bikes are always a little bit of a curveball for me, right? Because uh, I'm not as familiar with the technology, so I'm gonna do my best here to talk you through <laughs> what we got going on. Um, it's essentially a um, steel tube trellis frame, which you see on some ice bikes as well. And the main thing taking up all the space in the middle here is the 17.3 excuse me, kilowatt hour battery. The motor's back here, and it is belt drive, which again, you see on some ice bikes occasionally. So the chassis is a pretty basic setup. It's a Showa shock with some remote adjustment, which is kind of nice. Inverted fork, steel braided brake lines, and big beefy calipers from J. Juan. So the sort of basic structure is not hugely dissimilar from gasoline motorcycle as far as the, the chassis setup, just the sort of like battery motor thing is a little bit different. And of course, that leaves a lot of empty space up in this area. And what that means, um, for one thing, is there's a frunk. 7.4 gallons is what Zero claims, although I think it feels more like four gallons, maybe. <laughs> uh, you can't get a helmet in there, but it holds lots of stuff. I got a flat kit in there right now, just uh, in cases. These little guys are also uh, storage. As you take these little Torx things out here, there's, um, it's like you got to use a wrench to get to it, and the storage space is like... A little awkward, but it is technically more space you can use that you can't usually use on uh, a conventional bike because there's stuff there, usually cooling or radiator stuff. So <laughs> that's kind of handy. Uh, another little featurette, I guess, that I might want to cover now is the uh, windshield adjustment, which is these big uh, knobs here in the in the cockpit. This gives you a little bit better angle. Then you'll be able to see when I do it when we're riding. Um, but I'll probably play with that a little bit. It's got little adjustment markers to tell you that you are 32 millimeters above all the way down, which I don't actually know how that helps, but um, I don't know, a little whiff of quality if nothing else. So before we get going, I did want to circle back to the battery real quick. 17.3 kilowatt hours is the capacity of the battery. And sometimes with we motorcyclists, if you're not familiar with elect electric motorcycles, it doesn't really mean anything, right? Like what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> So I did a little bit of research in the electric vehicle world to help give some context. And I have some uh, data on my phone here. This You can tell that I did research because I put words on a page. Very impressive, don't you think? I looked up the, um, the battery capacity of the five electric vehicles that I anecdotally see the most of <laughs> where I live. Doesn't really matter. Two, two Tesla models, a Chevy Bolt, Nissan Leaf, and a Kia EV6. The average um, battery size for all those sort of variety of, uh, of cars is approximately 67 kilowatt hours. So that's three or four times larger than the Zero's battery. So when we talk about range later, hopefully I can see a little bit of context. As far as other motorcycles go, the Livewire 1, 15.4 kilowatt hours. Uh, Energica Xperia, which is the Italian uh, electric uh, sport touring motorcycle that we've covered here on Common Tread, 22 and a half kilowatt hours. And then the sort of more city oriented bikes like the BMW CE 04 and the Zero FXE are between 7 and 9 kilowatt hour batteries, which should, those bikes have also been covered here on Daily Rider for what it's worth. So, uh, point being, this is a large battery in the motorcycling world, but still quite a bit smaller than you'd see in a car, not surprisingly. The thing that I think is interesting about that is that range is such a hot button with electric motorcycles, right? Like, oh, you can only go 60 miles. Oh, you can only go 100 miles. Oh, you can only go 140 miles, whatever it is. But it's interesting, I think, that this battery is 25% 
the size of some other electric car batteries. Where it's pretty common for a motorcycle to carry five gallons of gas, and it's pretty common for a car to have 10 or 15 gallons of gas on board. So I think gasoline bikes might have a little bit of an advantage there, whether it's development or just the way that vehicles have come about, that they're bound to have slightly closer range figures to, to automobiles. Anyway, a little bit of food for thought before we get going here on battery sizes. And uh, of course, now it's time to turn this thing on and not listen to the uh, engine because it doesn't have an engine. It has a motor that doesn't make any noise, but also has this big old uh, TFT dash here, which is pretty pleasing to look at. Which we'll spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so looking at here. You can see you're basically fully charged at 95%. I have zero miles on the trip and the claimed range is 96 miles as it stands. Speaking of stands, it's got a little no, uh, note there that the kickstand is down, but let's fix that. Let's get the kickstand up and uh, ride to work on this here e-electric motor cycle. Eco mode engaged, throttle on, let's go. Okay, no team, let's talk about some specs, shall we? With that battery all the way full, not that it matters, the DSRX tipped the scales at Revzilla West at 543 pounds. So it is definitely a full-size motorcycle, no doubt about that. The seat height is 32.6 inches, I believe, which is, I think, pretty reasonable for an adventure bike. As you can see, six foot two, I got a pretty good bend in my knee, pretty easy to touch the ground. So for this style of bike, I think that's a pretty approachable seat height. Though, you know, it's not making any promises about being a beginner bike, whether it's the seat height or the price. Which, as I mentioned before, the price is, uh, MSRP is $24,500, I believe. Um, one thing that's a little bit different about electric bikes compared to an internal combustion engine or ICE bikes, as they're called, um, is that there are sometimes incentives for electric bikes, right? So, uh, depending on where you live, I think as of the record date of this video, there's an incentive available for this Zero DSRX that brings the price down to about $20,000. So, something, uh, something to think about. Yeah! <laughs> like I said, it's electric, huh? Oh, shit, cool! Alright, so yeah, there you go. Big electric bike fan. Uh, what other specs we got to talk about? Claimed horsepower is about 100, as I mentioned in the introduction. Claimed torque figure is quite high, 166 foot-pounds, which uh, for electric motorcycles is pretty common for the torque figures to be higher by comparison to horsepower than for a gas-powered bike. And the DSRX has got some get up and go. We're in eco mode now, so we're kind of taking it easy, but we will experiment with a bit later. It's definitely pretty sippy. Let's see, what other specs? We talked about horsepower. Oh, I wanted to talk about, there is also a power tank upgrade that you can do to the battery for what it's worth to make the 17.3 kilowatt hour battery into a 21 kilowatt hour battery. I believe it's a $3,200 upgrade from the factory so you can make the battery larger, essentially. <laughs> uh, you lose the front space if you do that, I think, but uh, that's an option just in case anyone was curious. Clean run at the on-ramp. Just, oh, just about. Okay. The clean run's over. That was fun while it lasted, though. <laughs> Plenty of time to talk about ergonomics now. <clears throat> uh, yeah, ergonomics and riding position on the Zero DSRX are um, quite accommodating. It's very comfortable, in my opinion. I feel like the seat is a little low. It's not awkwardly low, but it feels pretty low the first time I sat on it. I've sort of gotten used to it now. There's not a ton of leg room for someone my size because the seat feels kind of low, but that does, of course, make it pretty approachable. But aside from that, it's very comfortable. The seat's pretty good. Nice wide handlebar with a pretty generous sweep back toward the rider, so it's very neutral and upright and, yeah, just straight up comfy which is an attribute of ATVs or Venture Touring Motorcycles that has been adapted for this model and adapted quite well, I think. Quick note here, as we sit in traffic and go slow, you'll notice that the bike was claiming 96, 95, 96 miles of range when we left. We've gone three miles and now it's claiming 97 miles. So this is something that the, that the range does, now it's claiming 98. It's always reading the situation as modern vehicles often do and updating the approximate range that it thinks it's gonna be able to make. And obviously in this sort of urban slow speed riding the regenerative qualities of being off the throttle are quite helpful and it's a good environment for this type of powertrain woof damanga 
This traffic is quite serious, everybody. Usually at this point we can talk about highway comfort and manners. <laughs> this is not going very well so far, so I just going to jump into it in case we don't actually get up to speed. <laughs> what I was going to show you is that Eco Mode is limited to 73 miles an hour, I believe, and that just sort of puts a cap on the maximum output and the maximum speed of the bike which uh, obviously is designed to be economical, hence the name of the ride mode. But in general, the freeway manners are quite good. And of course you can spin the old windscreen up and that takes wind blast completely away from my chest. It makes it, makes it a little loud around my helmet, which I often struggle with on bikes in general. So I feel like the wind protection makes this sort of turbulent air around the bottom of my helmet. But in general, it's a nice place to be out on the open road on a Zero DSRX. All right, we found the source of the traffic. I would like to point out now that we have a little bit of open road ahead of us that I mentioned eco mode limits output and maximum speed, but roll on power is still pretty good in eco mode as we'll, as I'll show you here. It's not super fast, um, but it pulls up to its maximum speed in a perfectly reasonable amount of time. I find it to be pretty reasonable. I like riding around in eco mode, not least of which because it's one of the few modes, maybe the only mode in the basic mode setup, which we'll talk about later, where full regeneration happens when you're off the throttle, which I appreciate, as I think that really helps. Speaking of range, you can see that the, the, the uh, calculator range has plummeted now that we just went 70 miles an hour for a few miles and the bike's reassessing that and understandably deciding that it can't go 100 miles anymore. I'm going to go over to sport mode just because I kind of feel like it and we can talk about actual range for the um, DSRX, which I found mostly to be between 80 and 100 miles the way that I ride on the freeway around the city, that kind of thing. I think Zero claims something like as many as 180 or 150 miles of range within a city. I never rode it around at only low speed for 100 plus miles, only in neighborhoods, only stoplight to stoplight. So I didn't experiment fully with that, but it is very clear that if you ride around at low speed as we experimented with stuck in traffic through my neighborhood, that kind of thing, that the range of the bike goes up quite a bit because pushing through air at this speed, for example, is much harder for the bike to do than stop start. Another real hot button issue with electric bikes is charge time. And you can use a fast charger, I think what they call a level two charger for the DSRX, the little ports right here. And charge time with that seemed to be between two and a half to three hours from a, like a low battery below 10%, say. If you plug it into your wallet, your house, it's probably gonna take a lot longer than that. In fact, it's going to take a lot longer than that. I would often just plug it in overnight. Like if the battery was low, down below 15 or 10%, realistically charge time is gonna be eight hours or more, depending on if the battery is depleted even more than that, which some people think is totally unacceptable. And I can understand that viewpoint, but practically it actually worked pretty well for me. I just like would ride the bike around and then when I get home, I plug it in and I just leave it plugged in overnight. And then when I get up in the morning, it's got a full tank and it only costs a couple bucks for whatever that's worth, which is pretty good. On the face of it, it seems absolutely absurd that you would ride the bike for, you know, 30 miles down the highway and then 30 miles back, and then you have to plug it in for eight or nine hours. It's, it's, it just sounds ridiculous. And it's like something that compared to a gas bike is like, why would you ever do that? I think it's just all part of the conversation around electric bikes being a different experience, right? Like I said, practically for me, it worked fine. The charge times are long, but, I got to sleep sometime, so it was okay. The part of that discussion where I really struggle, to be honest, is billing this bike as an adventure bike, right? Like, go adventure touring, go, go, like, find your limits, expand your horizon. And I just don't know if riding the bike for 100 miles and then having to plug it in for two or three hours, even on a fast charger, I don't know if that really is the same experience, right? Can we agree that that's that that changes the the tenor of the conversation a little bit and you know it is what it is like zero is hemmed in by the technology available in our world today and it has presented the two-wheeled world with a machine that is sort of the best of its kind or at least one of the best of its kind at doing what it can do but it, it certainly makes some sacrifices as electric bikes compare to typical internal combustion bikes there's no question about that one good thing the mirrors dead smooth dead smooth. That's uh, some electric bikes you got going for them. And I do like mirrors. So, you know. All right, into the urban section here. I guess I'm going to take it out of 
sport, although who cares? I'll put it in standard, why not? We'll roll the screen down to give a little bit better view. And we'll talk about the round town manners of the uh, ADV styled DSRX. Um, interestingly, okay, we got we got a footless stop. We got one in the book, so that's good. Interestingly, footless stops, a little tricky with the DSRX. Not because it's not a well-balanced bike, because it is. The chassis is quite good, in my opinion. And the weight is fairly low because the battery is kind of slung down in the, in the chassis like that. But one thing that internal combustion engines have going for them, which I didn't really think about until I started thinking about footless stops on the DSRX, is that there's rotating mass, right? Which helps add stability to a machine. Uh, you couldn't do that. Fill the stop, is it? And uh, the electric bike doesn't have that. There's there's no crankshaft spinning around in there, um, which I think makes the old footless stops a little trickier. I, just something to note. I don't know that I that I stumbled across in my daily rider research. One place where an electric motorcycle like this has standard motorcycles completely waxed is throttle response. The throttle response on uh, DSRX is. It's, I mean, it's perfect. I don't know, I'm not sure how else to couch it really. Um, it is just extremely predictable and, and, and ultimately smooth. And it, there's never any, I don't know. <laughs> there's just never any bobble, right? Because there's no fueling, there's no emissions, there's no mapping, there's no explosions happening inside there. Um, and uh, for better or for worse, uh, in this case for better, <laughs> It changes the dynamic of the bike quite a bit, uh, and I, I I will say I do love the the throttle response on uh, an electric bike, and this one especially is very very good. <laughs> and just one more note there, I did not always find that to be the case with zeros. I have ridden zeros in the past where I thought ah uh, it's not great actually. I don't love it. Uh, it, it, it doesn't feel like a motorcycle. It feels like a remote control car, some other vehicle that I, I don't quite understand the dynamic between twisting the grip and, and what kind of power I get out of it. But um, it's one of those things that Zero's figured out over the years and it's a piece of refinement of this bike that is quite good. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the round town manners of the Zero DSRX are excellent. Perhaps best in class. I can't think of a sneakier way to zip around a city and have fun and not cause a ruckus than this bike. It's great. I love it. All right, on to Lover's Lane here. The Zero DSRX does have cruise control, this little button over here, which I forgot to mention on the highway section there. That's kind of nice. And yeah, passenger accommodations on this bike are pretty good, actually. I think that's something that Zero focused on when it put together a bike that was supposed to be a touring bike, as you know, like you can be as offended as you want to that an electric motorcycle company would call their motorcycle a touring bike, but it's comfortable, if nothing else. And that goes for the passenger accommodations as well, which is a nice feature. And before we go down the other side of the road here, I'm gonna switch my ride mode over into Super Plus. <laughs> That's a ride mode that I built in the Zero app. And I just cranked everything up. All like full regenerative deceleration, full power, full everything. Max, 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 Super Plus. And uh, I think as we go down into the twisty road section here, I like the idea of having the regen there, but also all that snappy power on tap. And more good news now that we're in the twists and turns here. As you might have caught a sneak peek of when we were on the on-ramp to the freeway earlier, this bike's great in a set of curves, really good. If you don't think a 550 pound bike can be good in a set of curves, then you've never ridden a BMW GS and that's okay, but there's no reason bikes like this can't be great on a twisty road. And this bike is great. It's easy to use. Throttle response is perfect, as I said. The brakes are very strong. The balance of the chassis is good. It's communicative. The suspension is good. It's as good as it needs to be. There's lots of travel for what it's worth. It's seven and a half inches of travel. So if you do get to a bumpy section of road, whatever it may be, there's plenty of stroke there. It's just a good bike. It's just good. And that actually circles back to one of the questions I asked in the intro, right? Like, is it fun to ride? Yes, it is fun to ride. If you haven't picked up on that yet, hopefully the rest of the ride will deliver that message. But also it's just a nice piece of equipment. There's no two ways about it. The world, the internet is awash with electric motorcycle noise and garbage, just products that are bad that you can buy and they can be shipped to your house or you can 
I don't know, I'm not gonna name any particular names, but the point is, the reason I referred to this motorcycle as a full-blown, bona fide electric motorcycle is that Zero is a real company with real intent and real research and development and real results in the world of motorcycling. It, it's a good quality product, in my opinion. Feels like a real bike. It doesn't feel like some Silicon Valley startup tried to make a motorcycle and this is the best they could do. It feels like a motorcycle. You have to have a heart of stone not to appreciate Zero's journey and where the product has gotten. All right, a little bit sad to leave the twisty roads behind, but just about any city surface street's pretty fun on this bike anyway, so. <laughs> All right, here's a red light we can experiment with braking. Phew. Yeah, good brakes. Not much of a pull to, oh wow, we got a green light right off the bat at this one. That's rare. Anyway, the brakes are good. <laughs> um, decent hardware, as I said, and um, plenty of power. It's a big bike. It's, you know, 500 plus pounds is, it's a lump to stop. And uh, ABS does engage um, sometimes quicker than it feels like because the bike's kind of narrow and doesn't feel as heavy as it is. But just like with any big bike this size, it's gonna take some doing to bring it to a halt. And as we approach this red light, uh, let's talk about the dash, I think. The dash is split up, uh, it's obviously speed in the middle there, and then your mode up above in the center. If you hold down this button over here and then scroll through, you can do, uh, you know, Rain, Eco, Standard, Sport, and Canyon are the base modes. These quadrants are all adjustable. So I have trip A, range, ambient temp, and watt hours per mile. And then uh, battery in the bottom, clock, heated grips, TC, and uh, throttle map stuff, odometer in the bottom there. These quadrants are all adjustable so you can put sort of a variety of information in there um, and to access that menu i think you got to shut the bike you got to toggle the switch off and then you can go in here uh, to preferences <coughs> gauges and then you can choose these quadrants here right a b c d so on and so forth the menu system works pretty well i think it's a little clunky and i don't think it's organized particularly well but in general it's pretty good and the dash is clean it's laid out pretty well i don't have a lot of complaints in that department i don't think it's um yeah, it's fun to look at and, and uh, fairly intuitive. Um, and it's fun that it's customizable. So at this point, I think we need to circle back to the bigger question that I asked at the beginning of this, right? Is this bike an adventure touring bike? Is it an ADV? D does it count because it has a 19 inch front wheel? Because it has seven and a half inches of suspension travel? Because it's comfortable? And I just, I just don't think that it is. And I think that's actually a really big disservice that um, that has been done to this bike is to bill it as an adventure touring bike. And I get why Zero did that, right? It's like ADV bikes are all the hotness, they're all the rage. They want to tap into that market of people who wander around, who want to ride off-road. And it's not that you can't do that on this bike. It doesn't suit the the personality or, or really like the, the engineering brief of what this bike is bound to be. It's a bike that can go 100 miles or more if you're riding in a city, sure, on a charge and then has to be plugged in for a while. It's almost like a new category of bike. I, and if there are other motorcycles that serve this purpose, right? Like a, a Yamaha Tracer 9 or a, a Kawasaki Versus 650 or Versus 1000 for that matter. Bikes that are very road oriented, obviously, but they have up these upright ergonomics, right? Like a, a flat wide handlebar and, and sort of a, this quasi adventure looks. And the reason those bikes get away with slipping into this category is that you can call them touring bikes, right? I mean, the Versus 650 or, or a Tracer 9, those are great touring bikes. A lot of times what those bikes are used for and what they are maybe best at is riding to work. Like, like I've been doing here today on this bike, uh, uh, riding across the city, taking a trip of 15 to 30 to 50 miles. And that's pretty typical for a lot of motorcyclists. And I think that that's what this bike is. I almost think it has, if not created a category, it's it's um, it's made its way into motorcycling in a way that is fresh and new. And I think we struggle with labels for it <laughs> to say, well, it's not an adventure touring bike because it can't go far enough and I'm pissed off about that. Well, fine, be angry about it if you want to, or look at what the bike does well and try not to label it that way. That's That's how I feel about it. So, I don't think it's fair or good to call this bike an adventure touring bike. I think it's an urban assault vehicle with ADV looks. And if you bill it that way, yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's heavy, but it's also bitching. <laughs> it's really cool. So that's my take, everybody. And when it comes 
to riding down a dirt path here. Um, is there an adventure mode actually? I don't think there is. Sport, standard, eco, rain. Uh, whatever, who cares? Um, we'll go to we'll go to rain mode right now, so we can experiment with the trash control in rain mode, which is a sort of rain specific trash control. Ooh, yeah, the ABS is very invasive. <laughs> As is the TC. Uh, so let's go to Super Plus, which is sport trash control, which is also very invasive. <laughs> um, and uh, just for poops and giggles, let's uh, go into the menu and uh, let's shut off that uh, pesky trash control. There we have it. TC off, I believe. <laughs> and uh, this is another piece of um, of building a motorcycle that uh, Zero has actually gotten pretty good at, I think. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Um, is uh, making traction control uh, switchable and also eat, eat, choo choo train. But electric bikes are famously difficult to control when the rear wheel spins up like that. Um, and uh, the Zero DSRX uh, is an example of how uh, Zero has engineered uh, the motor and the, the controller to work in a way that sort of makes sense to motorcyclists because it doesn't, what the, what, the, what the motor really wants to do is just completely spin up, like light switch. As soon as it starts spinning, go completely out of control. But this bike doesn't do that. It, it, um, even with TC off, it allows you to spin the wheel, but it doesn't go completely crazy. It feels more like it would on an internal combustion bike, which you have to appreciate. Let's take a little urban adventure. Let's see if we can get around this train. Around this way, around this way. All right. Made it around adventure motorcycle. So is it not an adventure motorcycle? I think it might be. We just adventured around the end of that train and now we're on clear open road back on the daily rider route. <laughs> oh, we can experiment with wheelies, right? Uh, can you do a wheelie on this sucker? Yeah, you sure can. Wait, there we go. Look at it go. Yeah. <laughs> Big stonking wheelie. It's a fun wheelie bike. And again, back in the day, I remember riding a zero and trying to do a wheelie on it and it had enough punch to do a wheelie, but it was uncontrollable and weird. <laughs> and Ari and I almost looped the thing out a few times just trying to do basic wheelies on it. But now the, the throttle response is good and the it's just really kind of like linear and uh, predictable and usable. It's great, it's a lot of fun. All right, let's punch it here for a second, see about this acceleration. There you go, 40, 50, 60, 70. <laughs> uh, it's fun. It's not like Street Fighter V4 fast or you know, hyper naked fast or like a high horsepower bike, but it's zippy, man. It's really fun. <laughs> All right, last question. Can you back it in? Uh, you can, I shut off ABS and we'll give it a little try here. Ah, oh, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can do it. You gotta be very cautious because of course there's no, um, uh, it doesn't have the typical, uh, you know, sort of like engine working against the rear brake, which helps you control those kind of back-end situations. <laughs> uh, but you can shut off ABS, which I appreciate. And um, and yeah, if you haze that rear brake and um, and and get it just right, you can get it to do a little back end. <laughs> uh, it really is urban assault, man. It's uh, it's <laughs> it's really fun. How does it handle a U-turn, Zach? Well, good thing we have a whole section of Daily Rider just for that, everybody. We're gonna get close to this van. I got too close, <laughs> I screwed it up. Uh, okay, we're gonna go full lock to the left and feet up and yeah, two parking spaces. It's nice, good, good, good little parking lot weapon here. I would like to take this to the police rodeo that we did a CTXB episode on. Really, really fun bike. Uh, around town in my opinion that's the that's the zero's best attribute you might say i overshot the parking space a little bit and i want to go backwards but i'm lazy how do i do that you ask parking mode reverse 
<laughs> uh, it's kind of an absurd option. Um, but also kind of fun. And a big bike, you know, so if you park it down into a parking space or something like that, uh, you might, uh, I don't know, you might use that function, <clears throat> I suppose. All right. Well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna like uh, listen to it spin up or anything. Or can we, uh, maybe we can prop it up on its side stand here and we can, oh no, they don't let you do that. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. All right. Well then we'll, uh, we'll shut this bad Nelly off and we'll jump into some Instagram questions here, everybody. Let's, uh, let's jump right into it here. We'll start with the con artist who asks, how'd you compare this to the Harley Davidson live wire? So we talked about live wire specs, so it's a slightly smaller battery, but it's very comparable in my opinion, not comparable in the way that it looks, not comparable in the sort of like styling in the seating position or riding position, but capability wise, they're both punchy, fast, agile, good motorcycles to use. It's an interesting thing that's happening, I think, in the world of electric motorcycles, whereby you're starting to get the same or similar capability from a bike, but with just with a different take on the style or the sort of like brochure fodder that you get <laughs> around the bike. Both of them are cool. Both of them are fun, fast, punchy bikes, like I said, and they're my two favorites in the world of motorcycling uh, or electric motorcycling, I should say, for what it's worth. So yeah, I think ultimately pretty comparable. Next question is from Rubber and Metal, who says, part of the appeal for bikes is always upgrading it, be it installing an exhaust or a quick shifter. For electric bikes, how do you upgrade it? Good question. Interesting. I, you know, um, some of the stuff is the same, right? Like you do different tires, you do like different colored brake lines, you do a different windscreen, you do different hand guards, you do uh, like sleeker mirrors, you do a fender eliminator kit. I don't know, you know, some of the stuff's the same. As for the powertrain, you're right. It's not the same thing. I don't know. I don't really know. You get the power tank, you know, you get like a longer range, a little um, added battery capacity if you want to for this bike. But aside from that, it's a good point. And if that's a huge piece of um, the cultural attraction of riding around on a motorcycle to you or to others, then it is a little bit of a tricky question to answer. But I think, you know, most of the stuff is still up for grabs. I, I guess, you know, different foot pegs, different grips, different this, different that. You just maybe don't do the, the same thing to, you don't make it louder. I don't think, unless you put like a card in the spokes or something, you could always do that. Okay, next question is from AZN Redneck 188 who asks, I got a few questions about this, which is why I bring it up. The name seems to be a clear play on the Desert X from Ducati. How the two bikes compare or not at all? Um, they're not particularly comparable. They're both billed as adventure bikes, but the, the Desert X is a, is a true sort of classic ADV in my opinion. And this bike is different than that, as we talked about. I think it's mostly a coincidence. There was a Zero S, I think originally, and then a Zero SR, and then there was a Zero DS. And then DSR and DSRX, the X being for the sort of like adventure styled thing. But it's basically an evolution of the Zero moniker or sort of brand of naming convention. And I think it's mostly a coincidence. If you disagree, of course, chime in with how these two bikes are connected. Whether the Illuminati is involved or something like that, I'm not sure. Next question is from 512 megabyte flash drive who asks, realistically, can you think of a real life application for this motorcycle in which it isn't overshadowed by a gas alternative in almost every way? I'm not trying to sound hateful. I'm genuinely curious. And I think this is good. This is a good question, right? Is there even a scenario where this bike makes sense? Does, does that even exist? And I think, yeah, you can build a scenario where it makes sense, right? Someone lives in an urban center. They want to be able to carry luggage. They want a full size bike. They want quality. They want heated grips. They want wind protection because they zip down the highway sometimes. But realistically, they just never need to go more than a hundred miles. They need to store it in their house. I don't know. Is that crazy? So this thing doesn't smell like gasoline or oil and it's cheaper to fill up than gas bikes. And uh, it really does all the things that all those sort of um, quasi touring quasi ADV uh, urban assault type bikes do and it does it quite well I mean it's better in some ways than bikes that look kind of like it around a city so yeah I think from an urban transport standpoint yeah there's definitely a scenario where it exists it's still expensive and that's the thing that I think a uh, gas bike is going to overshadow it eventually right and one of the reasons gas bikes are going to overshadow it is that there are so many other options right there are way more types of bikes and models available in the ice category than in the electric one. So from that standpoint, it's always going to be pricey. But if you sort of want the capability of it and the scenario played in your favor, yeah, I think there is a scenario where it's the right choice. I think it's arguably rare, but I think it exists. And I appreciate the question. I like the, I like the, um, the broad view there. 
All right, last question here is from Danimal, who asks, you're doing the Revzilla West lunch run. How many burritos can you get in the frunk, and what kind of burrito is the DSRX? Ah, good questions. Good questions, Lauren. How many burritos can you get in the frunk? Um, a lot. You could get plenty. I mean, we have, you could probably get, I don't know, you probably, you, you get 8, 10, 12 burritos, and it, easy, I think. No problem. Which is more people than we have at Revzilla West, so, <laughs> um, so you could get all the burritos and some chips, I think, in the frunk there and feed everyone in my office anyway. As for what kind of burrito the DSRX is, uh, it's unconventional, right? You know, maybe it's a, more of a burrito bowl, you know? Maybe it's got all the, so, the sort of ingredients of a burrito, right? It's got rice, it's got beans, it's got meat, it's got, it's got pico, it's got guac, it's got some sauces if you want. It's got whatever you want in a burrito, <laughs> if, if you're into adventure burritos. But it's not, in, it's not wrapped up in a tortilla. Um, and that makes it like harder to use in some ways and it makes it a different experience for some people who don't Want a burrito bowl. They want a burrito and I think that that's the That's the, that's the thing that is it's a lot of the same ingredients It's just wrapped up presented a little bit differently and I can represent with this because I don't really like burrito bowls I like the walkabout nature of it. I like the tortilla. I like the flavor So it's a tricky thing for people to adjust their minds to but in the same way that someone ordering a burrito bowl Wouldn't get any hate from me uh, because I appreciate the, their decision and that's what the that's what they like I feel the same way about the D zero DSRX. I don't think that it's a lesser product. I just think it's different Maybe I'll get a burrito bowl for lunch, come to think of it. Anyway, uh, thank you for all those questions. That's great. Let's put the sucker on the Daily Rider leaderboard. That's going to be quite a conversation. Uh, stick with me. Here we go. All right, everybody, here we are inside of Zillow West Daily Rider leaderboard. Zero DSRX on the board and ready to go. As a reminder for the, uh, the leaderboard here, we got an SV650 at the top. We got Suzuki's new GSX-8S in uh, second place there. And Kawasaki Z650 RS rounding out the podium. As far as ADV styled bikes go, you know, ADV-ish bikes, a Honda CB500X is, uh, is fourth on the on leaderboard there. And I suppose, oh, and then uh, Spurge's 890 Rally is down here. <clears throat> I think a, a typical KTM 890 Adventure would be higher up, but that one is all spurgeoned out. The Zero DSRX, as a reminder for electric vehicles, electric motorcycles, um, the 2022 leaderboard, we covered two of those bikes, the Zero FXE, which is second from the bottom, down here, and then the BMW CEO4 electric scooter, very close to the bottom. And, and it's, a, it's always a tough judgment call because that Zero FXE, for example, and the BMW CEO4 for that matter, Super fun bikes, super fun vehicles. Really, the, the thing is the range. I can't rate a BMW CEO 4 over a Honda Grom when, when, when the Grom is priced the way it is. And, um, and realistically, if you were gonna ride a Honda Grom from Los Angeles to Seattle, it would, the logistics would be easier. The point is, the Zero has a hill to climb, right? Is it better than a Honda CV500X? In so many ways, yes. I mean, from heated grips to, to power, to wheelies, to uh, kind of comfort in general. I mean, the Honda CB500X is a comfortable bike. The DSRX is better. It's not a novelty anymore. It's not like, yippee, this is fun because it's weird. It's a genuinely good bike. It's really engaging to ride and it's awesome for slicing through traffic uh, on a commute. It's, it's great. However, <laughs> I just can't help but be kind of skewed um, by by the fact that it is that it is uh, that it is limited by its uh, by its electric range, um, and it's tough to put it above any of these sort of standard motorcycles that are such standard bearers in in their own category. You could make an argument that it would go here, right? At least you could also make an argument that it would go here. I hope I'm not showing a really horrendous bias here because I do love this bike. I just think that it's really hard for me to say, yeah, it's better than a Street Fighter V2. It's more versatile. It's not more versatile than that bike. And for that reason, I'm gonna go down here. I think the Zero DSRX um, is uh, realistically not quite as good as a, as a KTM 890 <laughs> Adventure our rally, even one in Spurgeon Dunbar trim, all knobblied out and whatever. Um, it's gonna go above the Honda CBR 1000 RR, uh, triple R, excuse me, SP, um, because I think, it's, I think it's more practical, it's cheaper than that bike, um, it's more comfortable. Sure, a Honda CBR triple R is, uh, is like, you know, you can take it to a track day and rip around and it's, 
fantastically capable in some ways. Um, but I think in the same way, a zero DSRX is fantastically capable in some ways. So it's going to go there. And it's definitely going to go above a Sondor's Metacycle because that uh, bike was not very good. There are plenty of arguments to be made for it being up here somewhere. Really, really, really good bike. I just think that this is the world we live in. And uh, if I'm being perfectly honest with you guys, really, truly, from my heart, my left arm is tired from holding up this camera, so that's the end of the episode. Thanks for hanging out. I hope you had fun, uh, and I very much hope to see you next time on Daily Rider. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Zach here. Remember me? We just rode to my office together. Yeah, so uh, just a friendly reminder that the way we make these videos here on RevZilla, whether it's um, high side, low side, or CTXP, um, or the shop manual, or Daily Rider, or first ride reviews, um, is we take money that we make from selling gear to motorcycle enthusiasts such as yourself. So just keep that in mind next time you wanna buy a helmet or a jacket or even a, a tent or some chain lube or auxiliary stuff like that. Check out RevZilla.com because the more of your money you spend there, the more money ultimately we have to make programming like this. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I hope you had fun.